Now that you've got your kit all settled, let's review how to put code onto the PIC and test your bake file. Uh, then let's go through the libraries that we uh, provide with the board to see what they do. Um, and we'll uh, come up with a new library to talk to the LCD screen, and we'll build the circuit that connects the PIC to the LCD and give that a test. So this will be a little bit long of a video because I haven't built that circuit yet. Um, so as I build it, I'll explain um, how I would build that circuit so that if you haven't done it in a while, you can see how to use uh, the breadboard. So the first thing we'll do is uh, let's go check our, uh, our setup here. So I've got a folder uh, that contains all of the code, all the sample code and everything I've been working on for this class so far. And I made a folder called Skeleton, which contains the makefile, uh, the nu32.cnh libraries, and the bootloaded.ld file. So this is the bare minimum stuff that I need every time I make a project. And um, I've already uh, made my talking pick example. The first thing we should check in our skeleton, though, is um, the paths and the name of our COM board. So this is a new board for me. Um, so the first thing we want to do is check what's the name of this COM port, the USB to serial converter. And on Windows, you could go to your device manager uh, and in the COM section, it'll show you all the ports that are typed in. Uh, if I, I'll turn my board off and I'm going to type mode. Here's another way to see uh, the names of our COM ports. Mode takes a second to run. Come on, mode. Okay, so right now there are no COM ports available on my computer because the board is off. I'll turn the board back on. You can hear my computer make that beep, beep, beep noise that recognizes a new device plugged in. I'll run mode again. Okay, and this time we get uh, a COM port named COM182. That's quite big. I've plugged almost every NU32 I've ever made into this laptop, and every time I plug a new one in, I get a new number. Um, so yours probably says COM4 or COM5, depending on how many COM ports you've ever used before. Uh, a much smaller number than this, but so mine is 182. So I'll go back to my make file in the skeleton folder, just to double check what I put in there. Um, I, it, when your COM port number is bigger than nine, you have to start with slash slash dot slash, uh, something about an escape routine that Windows doesn't recognize COM numbers that are very big. So uh, yours might just be COM4. It doesn't have to have the slash slash dot, dot slash unless you're a number bigger than nine. I've also got the location of uh, my compiler. We won't be using Harmony, so you can leave that blank. You don't have to install Harmony. If you did, you could uninstall it. I've got the path where I uh, compiled the nu32utility.c file into nu32utility the program. And I've got the path to my terminal program. Uh, on Windows, I'm using PuTTY. If you're on Linux or Mac, this will just say the word screen. If you're on L Linux or Mac, let's, let's just quickly talk about how to get um, the name of your COM port. Here we are back in the terminal. Nope, back in the terminal. Okay, in the terminal, you can use Linux-style commands, Unix-style commands, uh, ls for list, and slash dev slash tty dot star on a Mac would list any device that started with slash dev slash tty dot, and then it finishes anything with star. Um, on your uh, Linux computer, it's probably slash dev slash usb zero. should just verify that those are the right names. Um, of course, on my Windows environment, it doesn't recognize it. LS, it likes dir. Dir just tells me what are the names of the uh, files that are in the folder I'm in right now. So uh, let's test our make file and um, uh, build something. So I've already made sure that my skeleton make file matches the one in my talking pick directory. So I can uh, change my directory to be in my uh, ME333 folder. And I know in a folder it is called 2021. Uh, and in there is a full folder called talking. And in there is my make file and my compiled code. Now I just typed all that in manually. You should know that you don't have to. So I'll cd dot dot, I go back up 
a level and back to my original place. If I type CD and ME, and I don't remember or I'm too lazy to type the 333, if I hit tab, it will autocomplete for me. And I could say slash two, 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 one. Okay, it doesn't really autocomplete numbers very well. Um, okay, depending on, I guess, if you're in Linux or Mac, um, the autocomplete sometimes works better or worse. But uh, remember that you don't have to type everything in all the time. Hitting tab will autocomplete. That saves you a lot of typing. Okay, so I've been talking. Um, I haven't installed the program make on this computer. I've, I'm using make from MinGW. So instead of typing make and make write and make putty, um, I'm going to type MinGW32 make because uh, that's what I have on this computer. You probably installed make. So you could just use make. But if you're on Windows, you might be using mingw32 make. Okay, so I'm in the folder that has the make file. And if I type make in that folder, uh, it runs the make file. This make file is already run and the code hasn't changed. So it says there's nothing to do. If I, I can run uh, make clean and it goes through and it runs that command. It deleted all of the hex files, the map file, the O file. So now if I do dir again, I'm back to just my make file, my CNH files, and bootloader.ld. So now there's something to make. So I can make it again if I want. And here I'm hitting the up arrow to go back to you know, previous commands I've ever typed. That saves you some typing. So here's the make file running. It's calling the compiler. It's creating the object files. It's linking them into an elf file. It's converting it to a hex file. Then it's creating my disassembly. And if I type dir, I can see all those files that were just made. So every C file has an O file. And the elf file is the compiled code. The hex is uh, the bin to hex version of that. And now I'm ready to send that code to my pick. Uh, I have to put the pick in bootloader mode so it's ready to receive that code. Um, so I need to have the pick, uh, have the user button pushed when the pick turns on. So I'll hit the reset button and hold. I'll push and hold the user, I'll let go of reset, and then one LED will blink, LED one will blink. Uh, once you get really good at this, it's a rolling motion from uh, left to right, so I'm gonna click, 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 click. So you'll probably get really good at that. As long as you see LED one blinking, you're in bootloader mode. So now we can call um, make uh, write. That runs the NU32 utility program sending the hex file to the PIC in the PIC programs itself. Um, you can see the first thing happens, we open the port. You can get an error there if the port name is incorrect or the port's not ready. Um, it detects the bootloader, so it's talking to the PIC. If the PIC wasn't in bootloader mode, it would end there because it couldn't find the bootloader. Um, then it reads through the lines on the hex file, prints them out uh, a couple at a time until it's done. Um, so now I'm running talking PIC. Since the board is programmed, um, I'm no longer in bootloader mode, it's running that piece of code. That piece of code it turned LED1 off and LED2 on. And the point of this code is that I can talk to the board using PuTTY. Um, so I will use uh, mingw32-make slash PuTTY. If you're on Linux or Mac, you're probably typing screen instead of PuTTY. And in this case, a new window opens. Let me get my screen capture to recognize that. Okay, and so PuTTY is just a black window. PuTTY only shows letters or characters that have been printed from the serial device to the computer. And if I mash my keyboard, all those letters are getting sent to the PIC as I mash them. And this particular program, when I hit the Enter key, prints them back. And when I do that, the LEDs toggle so that the LED that was off is now on and the one that was on is now off. Uh, so if I just hit my Enter key, you can see the cursor move down and PuTTY because it's echoing those return characters. And each time I do, my LEDs flick. Um, and uh, I can type more stuff, and I can go back. And that's just a good way to test to make sure all of your code is working and everything. So um, now that we know the pick is working, um, let's uh, take a look at um, some of the sample code. There's a barking dog. Okay, so we don't need to look at the skeleton make file anymore. Let's take a look at uh, the talking pick program. 
and talkingpick.c. So we know that the compiler needs to know the addresses of all the, of all the special function registers uh, inside of the pick to be able to access and change the bits inside of them that make the pick do things. Um, so we have to include xc.h, which eventually includes the name of our pick.h, which uh, includes the structures and the locations of all of the special function registers. So where is that in this um, this file? It, we don't have xc.h. Instead, the only include we have is nu32.h. So that's our library that's specific to the nu32 breakout board. And that has to be in every single project you have from now on because we'll be using those functions. So the function, um, let's see, nu32 read, nu32 write, nu32 startup, those are all functions that come from this library. Uh, if we look at the h file, we'll see the prototypes. So we have our include guard to make sure that uh, we don't include this too many times. That shouldn't happen, uh, but just in case. Um, here is our include xc.h. So if we uh, track that down, we'll then see all of the things that our compiler is including for us. We also have another include file from the compiler in the folder sys and attribs. Um, this gives us some more functions that have to do with interrupt service routines. We'll get to that in a few chapters. Then we have some pound defines. So anywhere that the, we use the keyword nu32 led1, we're really referring to lat f0. Um, so we can set nu32 led1 equal to 1 or 0 to turn pin f0 on and off to blink our light. Uh, we can also read nu32 user. That represents port d. Port d is whether um, the input pin, the user button, is pushed or not. And then we've got another pound define, uh, the NU32 system frequency. Sometimes we need to remember how fast the pick is running. It's running at 80 megahertz. So here's a number that we can plug into some uh, equations later on if we ever need to reference how fast the pick is running. And then we have our function prototypes, NU32 startup. Uh, it's going to call some special function registers to make the pick do uh, certain actions and then a read and write function for uh, reading characters from the computer and printing them to the computer. And we can see the content of those functions in nu32.c. Uh, At the top of nu32.c, we have some more special preprocessor commands, pound pragma. So far, we've only seen pound include and pound define and pound if. Uh, so pound pragma is a special um, preprocessor command that tells the compiler to set the configuration bits in the code if we're using the pick kit or one of the special microchip programmers. So this is uh, code that actually does not get used when you're using the bootloader. It ignores it. Um, but this is here for reference because sometimes we need to go back and remember how the pick was set up in its hardware to know that we started with 8 megahertz and, and turned into 80 megahertz, for instance, by setting the PLL values here. If you're interested in learning how to do these, uh, we'll cover that in ME433, the next class. So those are there for reference. Um, we have another pound to find, the baud rate. This is the communication rate that the serial port uses. Uh, we'll talk about serial communication in a few chapters. Then we get the NU32 startup um, function. And inside the startup function, so this is a function we call at the beginning of every code that we'll write from now on, this tells the pick how fast to run. Um, and initializes some pins and things like that. So the first thing that happens is an underscore underscore built in disable interrupts function. And then the last thing that happens is the opposite built in enable interrupts. Anytime you see a function that starts with underscore underscore, that's, you know, that's a naming convention. The underscores don't mean anything other than the fact that the person who wrote this library is telling you these are functions that came with the compiler and you shouldn't change them. And you shouldn't have your own functions that use that, that name. <laughs> Um, so this is a special function we might look at in the future, um, and we'll definitely be talking about interrupts. So we're going to disable our interrupts. Here's another built-in function. We're going to be setting uh, some bits inside of the CPU that have to do with uh, whether our code should be cached or not. Here's some special function register sets. Um, these have to do with the prefetch. So essentially in the startup function here, we're trying to make the pick run as quickly as possible. At the penalty of it, it's probably going to use a lot more power than is necessary. But we're plugged in the wall, so we don't really care how much power we use. Um, then 
uh, we're going to enable uh, interrupts. We're going to um, not use JTAG. JTAG is a special device that could be used for debugging. Uh, they, it uses a lot of pins, and we don't want to sacrifice the pins on our board for something that we're not going to use, so we turn the JTAG off. These should look familiar. Here's a Tris F clear. So Tris is the tri-state special function register for whether pins should be inputs or outputs. If we're clearing some bits in Tris, that means we're setting those bits to zero, or really want to say we say we clear bits to zero, or we set them to zero, set them to one. So we're clearing um, this set of bits to uh, zeros. Uh, the number three in hex in binary is one one, so that means bit zero and bit one will be zeros. That represents pins F zero and F one. So we're making those pins outputs because that's where LEDs are. And then we're turning um, this lat on, uh, which, because our LEDs are wired backwards, means that that LED will be off and this LED will be on. So we've initialized our LED pins. Then we're going to initialize our UART. Our UART is our ability to talk to the computer through the UART to USB converter. That's what makes our serial port. Um, so these are all the special function registers necessary to set to make sure we can talk over UART. And that's it. That's the setup, uh, the startup function. So every time we have um, some code now for the NU32, the first thing we'll do inside of main is, after we declare some variables is we'll call the startup function to make sure that the UR is ready, the LED is ready, and the pick is running as fast as it can. Okay, uh, more functions. Um, reading from the UR and writing to the UR. Let's start with writing because it's a little easier. To be able to send letters to uh, the computer to see them, uh, we no longer have the printf function. Printf on your computer specifically printed to your screen. Um, instead, what we'll use is sprintf. sprintf will write the, the string into a character array, and then this function, nu32 write uart3, can take in a pointer to a character array, and it will print all those letters to the computer. We don't have to specifically worry about how these special function registers are working just yet, um, but this is a function that takes the name of your string. After you've used sprintf, this will send it to your computer. Uh, now we need something that is similar to scanf. So instead of using scanf, which read from the keyboard, first we're going to call readuart3, and it takes in a pointer to a character array. So everything it reads in will go into that character array. And then you can use sscanf to figure out what content is inside of that character array. So every scanf is now turned into a readuart3 and an sscanf. Every printf now turns into a uh, sprintf and writeuart3. The only thing you really need to know here before we try to dig into the contents of uh, UART is that this is what we call a blocking function. Uh, when you call the readuart3 function, it's going to sit there forever until the computer sends it a slash r or a slash n character. So that means that it's going to sit there every byte that gets sent from the computer to the NU32, it's going to get stored into your character array. If it gets too many letters, it will wrap over, so the max length remembers how many are in message, and then it starts to overwrite itself. And it'll sit there until it gets a slash n. Uh, that's helpful to remember if your code's ever seems to be frozen. That probably means, oh, I was supposed to send something uh, to it uh, using screen or putty. And we can go back to our main program. So we've called startup. All of the functions are ready. So we will call read uart3. We will save whatever gets typed into this character array message that has 200 characters in it. Um, then we'll immediately write it back to the computer so that Putty sees what we typed. Then we will print a slash r slash n so that the cursor moves to the next line. And finally, we will toggle our LEDs. So LED 1, if it was a 0, is now becomes a not 0, so it becomes a 1. Um, so it toggles. And LED 2 also toggles. And we go back and then we wait for the next character to characters to be typed until we see a slash r slash n. And we print them, and we toggle our LEDs and go back and forth forever. So that's how talking pick works. I think now what we should do is uh, build a circuit and do something other than just using the button and the LED that are on the board. I'll assign probably some little assignments that just use those, but uh, let's start to talk about how to build a circuit and because we're confined to only printing data to our computer to be able to see it, let's figure out also how to use this little LCD screen uh, to print data to it. 
Um, so, the first thing about a character LCD, it comes with a little plastic film on the front, so we can take off that plastic film. It doesn't really do anything. Uh, this is what they call a 16 by 2 character display, which I don't know what hardware you would see this in now. Probably um, your uh, the, the thing that reads your credit card in an older style vending machine prints in and it'll have uh, one row of, of characters um, that look kind of blocky and then one more beneath it. And each row has 16 possible positions for letters. So this is not a display on, like on your phone. That has individual dots, and then the, the processor has to figure out which dots to turn on and off to make letters. Uh, in this kind of character display, the pick will send literally what letter it wants to show up to here. This guy already knows how to show specific letters, and it will put a letter at a certain position. So we'll have control over where our cursor is, and then when we print to the screen, the string will show up. But we have to remember we only have 16 letters wide and two letters down. This is an LCD display. That means that there's one master backlight behind this whole thing and then little tiny screens in front of it that we can turn on and off so that they are transparent and let the light through or they block the light. Uh, without that backlight, we probably don't see a whole lot here because the, we need light to shine through the LCD. This is different than an OLED screen where it's actually every pixel is a little LED that they can turn on and off. So there's a lot of pins to control this thing. These aren't super popular to use anymore because they take so many pins to control. Um, and I don't know if you can read it in the video, but it starts on the left with VSS and VDD. Those are our power pins and ground. On the right, there's an A and a K. That's the anode and the cathode for the backlit LED. So that's the A and the K will get power and ground and a resistor to set the brightness of the back. And then the middle pins um, from RS, RW, E, D0 through D7, those are the data pins. Those are the pins that will connect to the PIC so that the PIC can send this thing information that says, I want to move the cursor to a certain position and I want to draw a certain letter at that position. This is... Um, demonstrated in the textbook. So let's take a look in chapter four. Here's a circuit diagram. You should always be working from a circuit diagram. Uh, our LCD, um, VSS, the VSS pin is ground. So we're going to ground VSS. VDD is five volts. Now we said that most chips uh, that will be interfacing to the PIC32 will be 3.3 because most chips nowadays run at 3.3. These LCDs are still kind of old technology. They still run on 5, so we'll put 5 volts there. Although I've tested most of these and they still work at 3.3, so choose 3.3 or 5. Well, well, why not? We'll use 5. Uh, the V0 pin sets the contrast, so like how dark are the pixels when they become dark. Um, and Somewhere up here we mentioned that uh, essentially a, hunt, a, a thousand ohms to ground on the V0 pin um, sets a, a nice contrast. And if you look around online more, if you have a potentiometer, you can actually make a variable, a little circuit here for variable contrast to get things darker or lighter if necessary. Uh, A and K, that's the backlight. Uh, we need R1, which is something around 100 ohms, uh, up to 5 volts. That'll set the, the brightness of the LED that's, that's in the back. Then the data pins D0 through D7 on the LCD, we're going to connect to E0 through E7 on the PIC. Um, so all of the E pins we can set simultaneously with one SFR writing to lat E, and that's how we'll be able to write 8-bit uh, numbers out to the LCD to display by setting literally each bit on a different pin. In addition to that, we have some strobing pins. So E, RW, and RS uh, will turn on and off to say, Right now, are we printing to the LCD? Are we saying, here's a letter to show? Or this is an instruction, like erase a letter or uh, move the cursor. So there's three kind of control pins and then eight data pins. And then we've got a bunch of powers and grounds. So let me torture you a little, um, and we'll build this circuit together. And then we'll put the code together. So in case it's been a while since you've used a breadboard, this white piece of plastic that the pick is plugged into is called a breadboard. It's actually three pieces of plastic. So if I bend this thing, you can see that the sides are not physically, they're just kind of clipped into the middle piece. Electrically, there's no connection between the sides and the middle. Um, the sides we call rails, and the column of holes next to the red uh, line, that's one piece of wire. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, and then the next column next to the blue line is another rail. And then we get more on the other side. So typically, we're going to have lots of circuits that use power and ground. So we'll put power and ground into these rails. And then we'll be able to tap off of those rails as we build our circuit. Then you can identify the pins that we need to connect from the NU32 uh, to the LCD based on that circuit diagram. We're going to use a lot of the E pins. And the E pins are kind of in this area here. And we'll have eight wires that go down to the D pins on this guy. So we're going to have lots of wires go back and forth. Now, it's usually safest to build the circuit with the power off so that you don't actually short something as you're building. So, okay, I'll turn my power off so that I don't accidentally short something as I'm building. And uh, we're going to get our wire out and we're going to cut and strip some wires. And um, we're going to try to build this as neatly as possible. Um, so that means we're not going to have big loopy wires like this that can catch something and fall out. We're going to try to make them as you know nice and tight across the board without driving ourselves crazy. This LCD circuit uh, we'll probably use quite a few times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to move it down to the very bottom of the breadboard so that it reserve more of the breadboard uh, for building other projects. Um, and we just use the space down here. That means our wires are going to be kind of long. Okay, the first thing I want to do is I want to find the power pins and put them in the rails so that I have, uh, you know, powered up my rails. Um, I'm going to put ground in the minus rail, so the blue ones, and I'm going to use black wire to do that because we, te we typically have a convention of uh, black wire is ground and then a red or a, like a purple wire is power. Um, so uh, how do I know how long this wire should be? It's going to start in the ground hole and it's going to have to go over to the minus rail, so something like that long. So I see that the top left and the top right pin are ground. So I can have a ground wire over here and I'll have another ground wire over here. Um, I'm going to toggle my camera real fast before it turns off its screen. Okay. And uh, so to cut and strip that wire, I'm going to unlock my wire strippers. I'm going to cut the wire with the cutter. Remember that these cutters are not super strong steel. They're only good for cutting wire, so don't try to cut other materials with those. I'm going to remove enough insulation so that when I plug my wire into the breadboard, it plugs in and I don't see any more uh, exposed wire so that we can't make a short. And I'm going to do that on both sides. So that's roughly like five millimeters of exposed wire on either side. And I'll bend that into a little U shape. So on the left side, of the board, the top left pin is called ground. There are two holes on either side of that ground pin. That whole row, because ground is plugged into it, are ground uh, zero volts. So if I go from that row to this column, now all the pins in the column next to the blue line are zero volts. We'll do that to the other side of the board. I designed this board specifically with both powers and grounds on both sides so that uh, you can hook up these wires on both sides. So hopefully you can follow along with this video. Pause when it's necessary and skip forward when I'm going too slow. Okay, so now both of my uh, blue rails are ground. I need five volts for my LCD, but most of the circuits will be building me 3.3. So I'm gonna tap off on the left side of my board with five and the right side with 3.3. Uh, so I'm going to use a red wire for my 5-volt connection. That's the third pin down. And it has to be just a little bit longer than my ground wire. So you know that you're using the right size hole on your wire stripper um, because when you clamp down on it and you pull, it doesn't get stuck. If it gets stuck, that means that uh, you're using a hole that's too big and it's not cutting all the way through the insulation, or you're using a hole that's too small and you're cutting through the insulation and then nicking the wire. You don't want to nick the wire uh, because then it will break at that point where the nick is and you won't be able to get the, the little broken piece of wire out of the breadboard. I'll try to use the convention here of a red wire is 5 volts and a green wire is 3.3 volts. That doesn't particularly matter, you just want to differentiate between the two different voltages. Okay, so now I've got my rails set up. 
uh, two grounds, a five volt and a 3.3 .3 volt. At this point, I'm gonna turn my pick back on to make sure the red LED turns on, that's my power light. That doesn't turn on when you turn this on. That means there's probably a short somewhere. You should turn it off, take out the wires, turn the board out, back on, make sure the red light still turns on, and then go back and find where your short was. Okay, we've got power on ground in the rails, so now let's power up the uh, LCD. Um, VSS is ground, so I need a ground wire from my ground rail to my VSS pin. Some people like to do Manhattan style wiring, which means they try to make all the wires flush against the board at right angles. Uh, no diagonal wires. That's not really necessary here, but if, you, if it makes you happy, you can do that. Definitely though, try to keep these wires not too long and loopy because we're gonna try to use this circuit again and again in all of our future projects. I'll have a five volt wire for VDD. And so remember that these rows that the pins are plugged into, it doesn't matter which hole in that row I plug into, um, there's no resistor in there, so uh, the potential is the same all across that row. Okay, so my LCD has power. Let me I'm gonna turn on the board. The LCD has power, but it doesn't do anything yet because we have no backlight. So let's do the backlight next. Our backlight are the A and K pins. Uh, a for anode, that's the positive pin, and K for cathode, that's the negative pin. And I know that those are in the last two possible rows of my breadboard. I'm going to build this part under, because uh, it's, it's well, I guess no, we'll build it over here so we can see it. Sometimes I take this out and I build those power connections down here. But then when you put this back on, you can't see them anymore. So you kind of forget that they're there. So let's not do that. Let's build it up here so we see it. So I'm going to connect my uh, K pin, the cathode, directly to ground. And I'll go to the other side of the board for that, because it doesn't particularly matter in this case, whether I use the ground on the left or the right side of the board. And there's a big white LED from the anode to the cathode. And an LED, a white LED needs like 3.3 volts to turn on. But we need to have a resistor in there to limit the current so that it doesn't burn out and get too hot. So that's why we need a 100 ohm resistor to go from the A to either 3.3 or 5 volts. It doesn't really matter. So in your little baggie of all the resistors and capacitors, I gave you a bunch of different resistors that are all... 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000, all factors of 10. The 100 ohm resistors are brown, black, brown, gold. So I'll find the brown, black, brown, gold, and I'll take one out. And just for convenience, I'm going to power this up with 3.3 .3 instead of 5. Uh, just because it makes my wiring a little neater. OK, so A and K, I'll turn my board on we see our backlight, uh, but we have no characters, of course, because we haven't talked to it from the pick yet, um, so it's not displaying anything. Sometimes when you show, when you turn these, oh, you know what, it should be doing something, but we can't see it yet. We haven't hooked up the VO pin. Uh, that's the contrast. So let's turn this up, off and we'll do one more thing. The VO pin gets a 1K resistor to ground. 1K is brown, black, red, gold. And so I can take the VO pin and I can go over here to ground. Uh, or I could jump to the ground that's a little closer either way. And you notice that these resistors are sticking up off the board. When I'm done and everything works, I might go back and trim these shorter so they're not sticking up so much. All right, we'll turn it back on again. Okay, and this is what you see when the LCD turns on, but it hasn't been able to talk to the pick yet. Um, we see all of one row of every pixel is on. And you can see the, the contrast here isn't perfect. You could probably tweak this resistor if you want to try to get a, like a darker um, uh, uh, contrast. Or we can try to sneak our 100 ohm resistor over to 5 volts. And then we got a brighter backlight. Maybe we should not use the 3.3 .3 for our backlight. That's a little brighter. Okay, so I'll try to keep that, although it might get in the way of all my data lines. Okay, let's sneak back to our data sheet. Uh, we've hooked up power and ground. We've hooked up VO, A, and K. So now we have our data pins. 
Uh, let's start with the individual ones that are um, not so obvious. So the RS pin, the RW pin, and the E pin, we don't worry about what those do just yet, but RS goes to B13, RW to D5, and E to D4. Okay, so RS is next to B0, and it's going to B13. You notice that all the B pins are down here next to each other. Um, and, ooh, my B13 is shorter than my B14. We'll see if that messes up the code. I don't think it will. But one thing to look for on your board are, do you see any solder bubbles? That's bad. Okay, so I need RS to go to B13. And I get to choose the color of my wire. Uh, we've got red, uh, black, and green are kind of reserved for uh, power, so I'm going to choose some other for these. I'm going to use a blue one for this one. And the different colors are just so that it makes it easier to trace. RS is going to go to B15. B13 to RS. And if I'm smart, I should probably turn the power off so I don't short anything as I'm building. So I'll turn off the power. Okay, the next one. Uh, RW goes to D5. Where's D5? D5's up here. We use a white wire for that. So you can see this is going to get a little messy, especially once we have to do all the E pins. That's eight more wires kind of stretching across the board. Not much we could do about that, so it can be a little messy. D5. RW. And the E pin to D4, which is right next to D5. I'm sure it's very riveting watching me build a simple circuit, but uh, hopefully you can pick up little tips if you haven't done this in a while. Okay, so those are the control pins to tell um, the LCD whether the data we're about to send is a, a, a character to display or a command to like move the cursor around. Now we need all the data pins. So we have to go from uh, E0 to D0, and E1 to D1, and E2 all the way from D7 to D7. So eight wires. I might try to cheat and make them all one color, although that's not a great idea because it's hard to, you know, maybe I reverse pins four and five or something, and, and that would create some kind of weird bug. But um, so maybe I'll do that. I'll use four different colors of wire, and I need two of each, and they're roughly uh, that long. These are going to be a little loopy, but after it works, I can always go back and trim them. Eight long wires. I need to strip both sides of each wire. That's 16 strips. First wire will be E0 to D0. I'll try to alternate my colors so I don't get confused. D1. A little history behind these kinds of LCD screens. Um, they actually have their own microcontroller built in because they're interpreting the command that the PIC is sending to them and then figuring out what uh, little pixels to turn on to draw the different characters, the different letters. And that's a very standard controller so that you can look up a library to figure out how to send data out of your eight pins from the microcontroller to the LCD. There's actually a different library that you could use that only uses four pins from the microcontroller instead of eight for data. And then it, it basically knows, well, I'll send 
uh, four bits and then another four bits to make up my 8-bit um, instruction or letter. So it takes twice as long to write the information, but it uses half as, much, as many pins. That's how serial communication was developed. So serial communication means uh, I'll have one pin send data serially, well, so one bit at a time. So it takes eight clock cycles to send one byte over. As opposed to what we're doing here, this is parallel communication. In one clock cycle, I can send all eight bits, but I have to use eight wires. So inside of our microcontroller, we've already talked about um, the CPU can request data, and it's 32 bits wide. So it's in parallel sending 32 bits at every clock cycle. Not very common outside of a chip to do that, though, because the wires at high speed tend to pick up noise and you know bad stuff like that. So serial communication, that's how the PIC is talking to the computer through serial. Um, I2C and SPI and CAN uh, and I2S, those types of communication all generally use you know, one wire for data. Sometimes it uses one wire for data in and one wire for data out, so that's kind of like parallel. But not like this. This is super parallel. Three wires for instruction and eight wires for data and then all these power connections. Yikes. <laughs> so we'll try not to let those fall out and we'll do a little test. We'll turn the power on and nothing's shorting. All our LEDs are on. The LCD uh, knows it has power, but it hasn't been told to do anything yet because we haven't put any code on the pick. So now it's time to find that code. So I'll show you my uh, file explorer here. Um, inside of the working directory where I put all my stuff, I've got my uh, book sample code for every chapter. And we're here looking in chapter four using libraries. We have an lcd.c and h and an lcd.write piece of code that uses that library. So let's copy all of those um, and we'll put them into a skeleton. So I'm gonna take my skeleton folder, copy and paste it. And I'm gonna rename this uh, my LCD project. And I'll put my three LCD files into my LCD folder with the four files that every project needs. And now I can switch over to Visual Studio Code. And we can examine this pre-written library and code that uses it. So we can close our talkingpick.c and we'll go look at um, LCD. And we'll start with lcdwrite.c. So this is a uh, our main uh, C code that is going to use the LCD library. So we'll open up uh, lcd.c and we'll open up everything here. And we'll hide this window. Okay, so lcd uh, write.c includes any32.h because we need access to all of our any32 um, functions. And then we have lcd.h which has specific functions for writing to the LCD. Uh, inside of main, we have a character array with 20 characters in it. And we're trying to remember how many times we've received information from the computer. So we've, uh, we've got this number received variable, it's initially equal to one. In every program from now on, we'll be calling anything to start up at the beginning to initialize the pick. And then here, our LCD library has a function for setting up the LCD. So there must be more pins to initialize to make the LCD work. Then in our infinite while loop, we will write to the computer, what do you want to write? Then we'll read back from the computer a message. We will clear our LCD screen. We'll move the cursor of the LCD to the top left, 00. zero. We will write um, the string that we got from the computer to the LCD. Uh, then we'll use sprintf to um, remember how many times we've talked to the computer, and we'll put that into a character array. And then we will move the cursor of the LCD and print that received a certain number to that line on the LCD, then we will print a new line to the computer, and then we'll sit there again at the computer being be asking to write some more stuff. Um, so why don't we compile this, uh, see how it works, and we'll come back and look at our library.
Okay, so we're going to go to our command window. Um, I've got putty open, so I'm going to close putty. And that gives me my cursor back. And I need to uh, go back to my original folder. And I can uh, CD into my LCD folder. And I can see that in there is my LCD library and my new 32 library and LCD at right. So to compile it, I do mingw32 because on Windows or everybody else just does make. And we're compiling and we can see uh, nu32.c was turned into nu32.o, lcd write.c was turned into nu32, uh, lcd write.o, um, lcd.c was turned into lcd.o, then they're all linked together by the linker, turned into an elf file, the elf is turned into a hex, and now I can see all those files that were made by the compilation process. We also got a warning, I think, at some point. We used sprintf, which is part of uh, stdio, but we never included that, so it gave a warning, but it it did it for us anyway. Uh, it compiled successfully, so now I can do uh, mingw make write. And I remember to go put my pick in bootloader mode. The single A is blinking, and I can call write. You can see that program is slightly longer than talking, so it takes a little longer. Um, and now, um, let's take a look real quick at what the pick did. Kind of got uh, a little bit of every pixel is on, so I think the contrast is a little off. But it's still blank because we haven't written anything from the pick uh, to uh, the LCD yet, uh, because we have to go into Putty and we have to type stuff to send it to the pick so that it shows. Um, so let me go into Putty, and I can do that by saying uh, make Putty. Here's what I've got in Putty. Putty, of course, doesn't show anything until I uh, type. So I'm going to say hello, H-E-L-L-O, and hit enter. And that says, uh, what do you want to write? Now, if we went back to our code, it was actually supposed to print that before it printed anything to uh, my uh, screen. So now I'm going to zoom over to my screen, show you I typed in the word hello. It says hello, and I received one thing so far. And I'll go back to Putty, and I'm going to type uh, uh, Hi there, and hit enter. And then my LCD says, hi there. This was the second thing I've received. And I can match my keyboard, hit enter. And each time I do that, I receive things, I get to hit empty things, and I get empty line. I can do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 letters. But there's only uh, 16 characters here. So anything that is larger than 16 just gets thrown away. Um, but if we go back to Putty, why, when I first ran this, uh, did I not get to see uh, what do you want to write? That's because as soon as I programmed the pick, it printed to the computer, uh, what do you want to write? But Putty wasn't open yet to see it, so it got lost. So sometimes it's safe um, after you've programmed the pick, but before you've been able to open Screen or Putty, uh, to uh, hit uh, open Screen or Putty and then hit the reset button and uh, the pick code will start over and print that stuff that you might have missed at the beginning. So every time I hit my reset button, it, it prints what do you want to write. There's no new line in that character. That's why it keeps uh, uh, adding on to the, the bottom without moving the cursor. Uh, what else should we know here? Um, the COM port can only be open in one spot at a time. That's why we can't kind of leave putty and screen open in the background and use the bootloader. When the bootloader is using the COM port, putty and screen can't be open. It can only be open in one program at a time. Uh, otherwise, you'll get some strange errors. So that's this program. Pretty fun. <laughs> Pretty fun. Um, so let's go back to that code and do a little investigating, and that'll be it for this uh, video. Um, so we're using the functions NU32 read and write. We've already talked about those. We used sprintf to uh, uh, put letters and numbers into a character array, and we printed character arrays. 
that makes sense. Let's just take a quick look at lcd.clear, move, setup, that kind of stuff. So in the H file, we see our include card, and we've got all these functions um, available to us that we didn't necessarily use. And some of these functions really just call themselves. And we can look at lcd.c. It includes uh, xc.h because it needs the names of peripherals, and without that, it doesn't know what this, perf what this SFR does. Um, let's see what we're using. We're using something called the parallel master port. So anytime you're using parallel communication, you're probably going to use a, spe a special peripheral called the PMP or parallel master port. So a lot of the special function registers we'll see in here start with PMM. Um, let's find our setup function. So in setup, we're going to turn off interrupts. Uh, interrupts might get in the way of these kinds of things. We'll talk about interrupts soon. We're going to have a bunch of special function registers to write. In this case, here's an entire special function register we're going to set to zero. And then we'll use the special uh, structures inside of our H file to be able to set individual bits without having to do complicated bitwise math. Um, so these are basically telling the parallel master port how to control those control pins and data pins to be able to send data back and forth. Really, the data just leaves the LCD. We don't get to read data back. We have some good comments in here that talk about what's the maximum speed you can talk to this uh, chip. So that we want to talk as fast as we can without getting errors. Then we're going to call functions like uh, LCD function, which is, uh, is uh, a command that instructs the LCD how it's about to work, and the display to like turn on, clear, which turns every bit off uh, or every pixel off so that it's you know deleted. Um, the, so when you look at a function like clear, clear is really using the right function and it's sending a command. And if we go to the right function, display, shift, function, here's right. This is, the, this is the function that's actually doing all the heavy work. All the other functions are basically calling the right function with different uh, instructions to send to the LCD. And we can see that here. Okay, I don't think we actually have to go through all these functions. Um, you could take a peek if you want. You don't need to understand how the parallel master port works as a peripheral, um, but this is kind of cheating that we gave you code that worked. What you should do if you want is change how this master code works, how it changes, how, how it moves the cursor around uh, and prints things to the screen. See if you can do something like print the number one, two, three, four, um, uh, like print one and have it wait a second, print two, have it wait a second. Then you know that you have mastered the ability to talk to your little screen.